I'm an Armenian American activist and when I was being brought up I knew nothing about um, Armenian history, language or culture and my mother had put me in this Zionist Jewish neighborhood <laughs> where I heard about the Holocaust every day and I was the only um, non-Jewish person in my public school and so I was discriminated against for being a Goya and experienced racism at a very early age and then I went to UCLA and in the library I read this book and discovered the Armenian at that time it was called Massacres and I, I was so shocked and I went home and I said to my mom why didn't you tell me about this and she said because it was too sad and then I transferred to Berkeley and I was in the Armenian Students Association and on April 24th which is the National Day of Commemoration of the Armenian Genocide because that's when they took uh, the intellectuals and killed them and um, we put up uh, photos of the Armenian Genocide in the library and the Turkish consulate called the library and said these are lies and uh, the school that I paid tuition for took them down and we were so angry we put them in Sprawl Plaza and this guy walked up to me and said why are you making up these photos as if we would <laughs> if we could make up bones and fields anything so I took the photos made a thousand flyers, plastered them all over Berkeley and started interviewing genocide survivors. I went to the churches and I said, is there anyone that you know that you know went through this that I can talk to since there was no history book I could read? And uh, so they put me in touch with these um, elderly people that were mainly women and I started interviewing them. And then I became a part of, um, I guess, the leftist movement. And what was going on in Berkeley at that time was a people of color movement. And I realized that, you know, when there was this rally on Iran, it was all white people talking about Iran. And uh, my friend Anahid was from Iran, and we said, well, you know, we're Near Eastern, Middle Eastern women, why can't we speak? And they wouldn't let us. So then I realized that I should join the People of Color movement and say that Armenians are not European, we're not white, we're an ancient indigenous civilization and that we should be a part of this movement. And even though we have uh, light skin privilege, light skin uh, people of color privilege is very different than white skin privilege because we do not have a secure place in uh, false history. <laughs> uh, our, you know, very heritage is being attacked by the white powers and they uh, kind of screwed us over and didn't help us. And so um, for 10 years that was a big struggle in my life to get um, the people of color movements to accept Armenians. And finally I got them to accept Armenians as Near Eastern people of color. But there was no backup in the Armenian community because a lot of Armenians wanted to be assimilated, they wanted to pass, their minds were colonialized. So it was a very hard struggle. So uh, for decades and decades being in um, leftist political movements like here in New York when there was occupied Wall Street, I went there and I was wearing this t-shirt which says Eastern Turkey is um, occupied Western Armenia and this guy came up to me and he said is this about Thanksgiving? And I, I was so shocked I thought oh my god I have to have a table here at Occupied Wall Street on the Armenian freedom struggle so I went to live at Occupied Wall Street um, and it was wonderful because in the years that I was doing uh, every year I do radio shows on Pacifica about the Armenian genocide and try to write to newspapers and get included and it's very hard to get included because Armenia is not on the agenda um, they don't uh, they don't care about all the issues and so my entire involvement in the leftist movement was how to connect Armenia to what was going on like for instance here in New York there's a lot of uh, free Mamiya people like Mamiya is this um, black activist political prisoner and there's a lot of people who are free Leonard Pielter and um, that's, he was a native uh, um, in the AIM struggle. So Armenians have our political prisoner, Hampik Sassunian. So I made a sculpture um, with Mamiya's and Hampik's and Leonard's picture in the same place and um, to, to try and bring some awareness. But um, 
you know, it's very hard because Armenians themselves don't even want to be associated with um, our own political prisoner who's been in jail for 32 years uh, because there was, what happened is, is that after the Armenian genocide, a lot of Armenians for 60 years were peacefully petitioning the United Nations for justice. No one cared. So at that time in the 70s, there were these... Um, you know, movements, and we had the Armenian Secret Army and the Justice Commandos, and uh, they were doing things to bring attention to the lack of justice in our struggle. And um, what happened is that um, just year after year, uh, there was a Turkish denial of everything, and in 1988, when there was the Armenian earthquake, uh, since I'm an artist, um, and this says a high benig, which means indigenous Armenians. Um, I thought, well, I'll go and help uh, in the earthquake because, uh, you know, I'll do art therapy with kids and stuff. And, and I'd never been to my homeland, and, and it was very hard to even get a visa to go there. And when I finally got there um, in the youth hostel, I met this guy, Monte Malconian, who um, was also had been in the Armenian Students Association in Berkeley. And he said that he was, um, there was a war going on in Artsakh, and I'd never heard of Artsakh, I'd never heard about a war, and um, I just want to show you that, um, okay, here's Armenia, and um, Armenia is an ancient country, they were the first Christian nation existing for thousands of years, and it's right next door to Azerbaijan, which only became a country in 1918. And uh, Stalin, to destabilize the region, knew that the Muslim um, Azeris and the Christian Armenians, you know, would um, not, uh, you know, would have conflicts. So he gave our land, Artsakh, which, um, that's the Armenian name, and the the other name uh, is Nagorno Karabakh. He gave it to Azerbaijan to destabilize the area, and this was terrible because Armenians in Artsakh, um, you know, were their human rights were being violated all the time, and um, so uh, what happened is like, um, for instance, my grandmother. One of my grandmothers is from Nahichevan, and they had that cemetery in Jilfa with over ten thousand hachkars beautiful carved tuff stones and um, in 2005 the uh, Azeri government they started like taking sledgehammers and knocking the the uh, hodge cards down and you know just last week I went to the indigenous uh, seminar and they're talking about um, UNESCO which is uh, formed to um, help preserve cultural monuments and the indigenous people are always talking about preserving their cultural monuments and this was our monument but so when the Armenians protested to UNESCO guess who was on uh, the board of UNESCO Azerbaijan got elected for four years to the board of UNESCO, which is supposed to punish people for destroying cultural or monuments, but they, uh, you know, they were the criminals, and so they did nothing about this. And in fact, they bulldozed. The, there were Armenians in Iran, which is right across the border, and they could see this, and they bulldozed our ancient cemetery, and now it's a military firing range. So that's one half of uh, my family, and now Nahichevan is being depopulated. It was depopulated of Armenians, and it now has Azeris. And then, um, you know, I'm in the um, community board member of my health clinic in Brooklyn. And what they do is they have these legislative luncheons to attract the politicians to help raise money for the clinic. And the borough president of Brooklyn, Eric Adams, at this, he got $7,500 to go to Turkey and um, promote Turkish tourism. And one of the cities he went to was Ghazi Aintab. And Aintab is where my grandmother's family was killed and they herded all these Armenians into a church and burned them alive. And they had cut off the hands of so many Armenian children you could pave the roads with them. And then he uh, also adopted a sister city, uh, Uskadar, which used to be Skidadi, which uh, Armenians were killed in that sister city and in the website it says oh this is wonderful to have a sister city in Turkey to promote educational and cultural opportunities for Brooklyn youth so here I am 
you know, like, uh, I was like, mm, how can we get the truth out to all these kids? How can we get the truth out to the Brooklyn president? And then not only that, I mean, Obama, I mean, he denies the genocide. I, I gave up a day to go and vote for him, and he lied to Armenians saying that he would, and he, he actually went to Turkey, Istanbul, on an anti-terrorism conference when the Turks are incredible terrorists. And so the Turks have spent, like, um, $200 million on uh, denialist uh, propaganda. While I was at WBAI on April 24th doing my show, outside the window was Turkish skywriting of these false websites in which they turn uh, all the lies around. It's just incredible what incredible false information they concoct and I guess they and and the problem is is it's so easy to tell a lie and it's so hard to to uh, overcome it and I have actually most of my life has been trying to overcome Turkish lies and it's it's been very hard because um, you know they have so much money and they have so our taxpayers money and and it's it's very hard so when I finally got to Armenia and I met Monte and he said, come, you know, and videotape this war, you know, and I, I hadn't heard of the war, I'd never heard of Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, and um, right now, actually, um, the war has started again. Uh, in April, um, uh, Aliyev, who's the corrupt dictator of Azerbaijan, who actually is supported by none other than Hillary Clinton, uh, which is really scary for me because um, I, you know, what are the choices of leaders in America? And she, she's so sneaky and behind. She gets donations from Azeris and Turks, and and she's she's and people think that she's you know uh, something else. But um, see how uh, just even mention of her lies, the sign on. <laughs> <laughs> Give me this sign. <laughs> this is, you know, I mean, I have to always carry these signs around so that people remember the Armenian genocide because Hillary Clinton is certainly not going to bring justice and uh, they talk about a democracy, but um, it's not happening in American politics. So, um, just recently, Israel sold Azerbaijan $1.6 billion worth of drones and um, anti-tank missiles. Russia sold uh, Azeris uh, six uh, billion and one of the reasons all this is going on is because of the BTC oil pipeline and um, Baku which is the capital of Azerbaijan has a lot of oil and um, America loves oil and um, they love uh, Turkish NATO bases and so um, Armenia is now considered to be an ally of Russia and um, so we're on the downside you know they're not supporting us like um, but for Armenians the indigenous people who in when I went to this war it was uh, like 1991 I got there um, in every family in Artsakh someone had died sacrificing their lives to to liberate this land from Azeri control and one of the things about Armenia is you know, Mount Ararat is Armenian land, and Mount Ararat is a sacred symbol of Armenia. And if you go to the capital of Armenia, you can see it from all the windows, but it's under Turkish control. And it's, we put this on everything in our uh, symbols, our paintings, our everything, and uh, the Turks said, well, what are you doing taking our mountain and putting it in your thing? And um, and then someone said to them, well, what are you doing taking the moon and putting it somewhere? You know, so, you know, they're very uh, denying about everything. And so um, the problem is, is that right now in Brooklyn also, this weekend is Mental Health Week in a thousand Brooklyn churches. They're talking about mental health. But why don't they talk about genocide denial and the effect on your mental health? And why are all these churches not concerned that Armenia, which is one of the first Christian nations, and a lot of you know, times people were given a choice, convert to Islam or be killed, or you know, nailed to crosses, or um, you know, burned in churches, and the fat of the people burned would roll out the sidewalk, and um, you know, priests beheaded. Why aren't these thousand churches in Brooklyn concerned with um, you know, that effect? And if 
Armenians, you know, the part of the problem is that Armenian churches don't do solidarity to those churches to say, hey, try and support us. So, in my life, um, it has been spent resisting assimilation because I grew up knowing nothing about my culture. At Berkeley, I was involved in black cultural studies, Chicano cultural studies, and I didn't even know that, you know, I had an own freedom struggle. So, I began to do a lot of research. This is a photo of what Armenian women some used to wear. And, um, you know, those clothes are no longer available. You know, it's hard to even find an Armenian dress, you know, that embroidered and that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the, these pictures of the genocide, these were taken by a German photographer. And, you know, it was at the risk of their lives that they're getting these things out. And these, um, you know, I, I try and put up uh, in different places because nobody knows about this. One of the outreaches I do is um, trying to compare the Armenian freedom struggle to the Palestinian freedom struggle. Because you, you hear about Palestine, if you're in the leftist community in New York City, Palestine is mentioned day and night. But um, Armenia never gets on the radar. And um, we have a similar struggle. Both of our homelands are occupied. Uh, the United States government, the taxpayers give uh, foreign aid to both Israel and Turkey, and um, people need to be aware of these similarities. And the Turks um, just really, uh, oh my God, um, they hold um, demonstrations in which they call Armenians liars. And they are. Um, it's like incredible because Americans know nothing about this. So when they see these, these signs, and this was in Times Square, and they actually had a gigantic uh, billboard thing which must have cost you know $10,000, and they're giving out these t-shirts, Turkey, yes, I mean, you know, to, to um, Americans and, and food and stuff. And these Americans getting into their subconscious, they don't know anything about this. And so, um, it's very ironic. This, this year when I took these photographs, I had gone to this reading at Barnes and & Nobles. And the Turks are famous for um, uh, getting after anyone who's talking about the genocide. So this woman was um, reading from her book, A Knock at the Door, in which her grandmother was uh, raped by a Turk. And five Turks stood up in the Barnes & Nobles and said, these are lies. <laughs> but fortunately, um, at that time, the district attorney, Morgenthau, was there too. And so I, he, he, you know, uh, took them away. But, but it's this constant, constant, that this is a fake. So all of the genocide survivors that I interviewed had to die being called liars and not acknowledged by their government that they paid taxes to. So when Monte told me, you know, come with me, there's a war going on in Artsakh, I said, okay, it's a very beautiful land. Um, very mountainous, a lot of uh, beautiful lakes and mountains. And I, I'd never seen a war. I, I went to Berkeley where being a soldier was, uh, you know, not too cool. And so um, he didn't tell me that they didn't want women <laughs> in his uh, place. And uh, it, was a, it was a struggle because um, when I got there, um, you know, they, they said, okay, you go in this car and we'll go on the truck with all the soldiers. But the car broke down and we had to push it. And this woman was walking by and I took her photo and it became a very famous photo as like the light of Artsakh because her face was, was so radiant even though there was all these wars. But then the other woman, like this woman, um, her uh, son had, uh, was killed by, you know, an Azeri and, and that was her life. And, and all these pictures of stress, of um, people trying to, all they, in Armenia, in Artsakh, they're like mainly farmers, you know, um, they grow mulberry, uh, um, pomegranates, apricots, they, they like to grow things in the earth and their animals. And so the idea that they couldn't live in peace because some conqueror wanted to come and kill them um, just created a lot of trauma. And uh, I had never seen a war. And um, I have to say, 
I just felt a big responsibility to give up my life and document this and join the armed forces. And, um, and also, I just felt like these people that were dead, I didn't want them to die in silence. I wanted the world to know about them. And so the women, I mainly focused on the women who you know, were sacrificing everything for uh, their families and um, living in very sick conditions. And I took these photos to Amnesty International and uh, Helsinki Human Rights, and they said, well, this is just an ethnic conflict on both sides. And that's, in the current situation with Azerbaijan attacking Artsakh, that's how the New York Times and all these other papers uh, describe it, an ethnic conflict uh, on both sides. And I told um, uh, Amnesty International, this is not an ethnic conflict on both sides. We're the indigenous people that have lived there for centuries. They're coming to attack us and grab our land and, and do everything. And you can, you're really, um, it's a lie to call it an ethnic conflict. And you know what Amnesty International told me? They said, we don't take into account history. And I said, how can you write this phony report without history? So, I spent a lot of time, uh, eight years of my life, in the war zone as a, as a freedom fighter. But I also tried to um, you know, reach out to the children. And I made this sign in English and uh, Armenian to help their school. And then the school was blown up and the sign was destroyed. <laughs> and I you know, met a lot of mine victims. Uh, the whole land in Artsakh is filled with mines. Uh, other um, women soldiers, like um, this is um, Aravid, uh, who was, uh, <laughs> when the war started, when Azerbaijan, you know, they're trying to get independence, she made an Armenian flag and she was immediately arrested. And then she made 14 others and was arrested again. And this is uh, Marguerite Sarkissian, who uh, was a sniper. And I was so proud to be at her side. And recently, Armenians had a, um, demonstration about uh, Artsakh in front of the UN and they had our heroes and they didn't have a single woman soldier and um, I am a war veteran I said I wanted to speak and this other guy was there they wouldn't even let us speak as war veterans I don't get any honor um, from my Armenian community but these were the times like this is how we got supplies you know and um, and but because we knew about the genocide and because this was an opportunity to um, be victorious around the genocide, you know, uh, people were skinned alive and chopped up and all that stuff, you know, uh, this was our time to, to, to be victorious. And the Azeris, they, weren't, they didn't really want to be there. So I, I wrote a lot about women soldiers. Um, I, if anyone wants to invite me to their school to talk about women soldiers in Artsakh, I'll be happy to come. And also there's a lot of, um, you know, Armenian youth that are really uh, trying to get the word out. But we need help. We need all leftist organizations to include Armenia. In, in, in their poems, in their theater, in their um, conferences, in their books. I want to hear the word. I go to everything and I never hear Armenia. And so that's why I do a lot of this. Um, also, there's um, this question of intergenerational trauma. Because I know that, um, you know, it's very hard when you have uh, all these corporations supporting uh, Turkey and nothing really supports Armenia. Like, even when there was a protest against Hillary Clinton um, by the Bernie Sanders people and her association with dictators, I called them up and I said, why don't you put her association with President of Azerbaijan Aliyev and how corrupt he is? And they never added it to their list. And so it's like a thing that they don't want to touch because it's too much trouble. And so emotionally you feel um, left out, you feel alienated, you feel um, mislabeled, you feel um, just uh, the indifference to your situation, the distortion of your reality. And um, so this intergenerational trauma is something that I have to deal with. So I'm going to a trauma group and also I have to deal with um, post-traumatic stress of being a war veteran in a community that doesn't value me as a war veteran. 
So um, you can reach me at Anoush, A-N-O-U-S-H, uh, 949 at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to speak more about this. Thank you. I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about um, uh, denial, which has a longer history than a lot of people realize. Uh, it, uh, it's not a phenomenon of the last couple of decades. It's been going on since the very inception of the genocide in 1915. Uh, but beyond that, there's a, there's a lengthy history of um, a prejudice and discrimination in the Ottoman Empire against minorities, especially Christian minorities. And this has come uh, to light uh, in a, recently in a very interesting book uh, written by a, um, uh, a Turkish-American, uh, uh, a woman who grew up uh, in Turkey and now works at the University of Michigan uh, named uh, Fatma Muge Gecek. Um, and it's interesting that there are uh, uh, probably our leading uh, historian of the Armenian Genocide is another uh, Turkish intellectual, uh, Taner Akcham, at Clark University in Worcester. And these people uh, have uh, interesting uh, histories that in some ways are emblematic of what goes on in Turkey regarding uh, this period in their history. Uh, and that is that uh, both of them report that uh, they grew up knowing nothing about the Armenian Genocide, even though they were born and raised uh, in Turkey. Um, and Gecek uh, describes an incident uh, in the early pages of her book uh, where uh, she's uh, hanging around in the sociology department lounge at Princeton University where she's a first um, semester graduate student and uh, an Armenian American student who learns that uh, she is from Turkey uh, attacks her very aggressively and uh, says that, uh, you know, want, demands to know why uh, she's responsible for uh, murdering his people. And she's uh, completely shocked by this. She's uh, never heard anything about this. Uh, she says her parents were uh, quite liberal, quite open-minded, um, multicultural in their uh, orientation towards uh, non-Turkish people in Turkey. She never heard anything negative said about um, Armenians within her family or friendship group. So this just comes out of the blue and kind of metaphorically slaps her in the face. And uh, she then gets very interested in where does this come from? And she does this investigation and she uh, comes to the understanding that um, uh, the Armenian genocide uh, is real. It actually happened and it's this horrible skeleton in the history of Turkey. And she writes this book. It's a, it's a, a 650 page book called a Denial of Violence, uh, the Ottoman Past, Turkish Present and Collective Violence Against the Armenians, 1789 to 2009. And what she's done is she's uh, collected a couple of hundred memoirs. Uh, most of them are written by Turks, uh, some uh, by Kurds and uh, Armenians and a few by uh, Turkish Jews. Um, and uh, she begins with 1789. Uh, because that's the beginning of the modernization of Turkey, or I guess we can say, if not modernization, uh, the beginning of Western influence in Turkish politics uh, and culture. And uh, she, uh, she concludes that uh, in these memoirs, uh, in the Armenian ones, there are uh, descriptions of persecution uh, going back to the uh, late 18th century. And in the, uh, in the Muslim ones, especially the Turkish ones, there are repeated uh, comments uh, that stereotype Armenians, uh, discuss them in a negative sort of way, perceive them as a threat. Um, and uh, what she argues is that the, uh, uh, the groundwork for what came later was already laid in, in the culture and political and social and religious organization of the Ottoman Empire. This is despite the fact that the Ottoman Empire was in some ways a liberal. Um, it was a multicultural empire. It uh, contained many people, not just Armenians, who had spoke other languages as their primary language. Um, 
it contained non, uh, non-Turkish Muslims, most prominently the Kurds, uh, and many Christian peoples, and also uh, Jews. Uh, in fact, uh, when Jews were uh, persecuted during the Spanish Inquisition, many of them, in fact, fled to the Ottoman Empire and were, uh, were welcomed there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Ottoman Empire never granted non-Turks equality. Uh, they were tolerated, they received some kinds of, uh, some measure of uh, autonomy in running their internal affairs and so on, but they were always viewed uh, as a, a second-class citizens uh, and treated as such. Uh, they were discriminatory tax policies. Uh, Armenians could never testify in court against Turks. Uh, they couldn't serve in the military. Um, they even, uh, in certain provinces, in certain historical periods, uh, were not allowed to wear clothes uh, in, uh, that were dyed in certain colors. I think red was the most prominent one because these were reserved for Turks. And there was a whole hierarchy of dress that conveyed superiority and inferiority. So there were a lot of these kinds of cultural features. Um, what happened uh, in the 19th century is that there were uh, many changes that took place in uh, Ottoman uh, Turkey um, as the empire declined and uh, increasingly Turkey was uh, uh, it was more difficult for it to defend its uh, politics and to defend its territories. Uh, the Greeks broke away uh, for example uh, in the 1820s created an independent state uh, the Bulgarians uh, in the 1860s or 70s did something very similar uh, and there were uh, revolts and uprisings uh, throughout the Balkans and uh, in the Balkan Wars uh, Turkey lost uh, almost all of its uh, European territories uh, even though it had controlled the Bal Balkans for very lengthy periods of time it also fought a losing war against Tsarist Russia uh, the, the, uh, the, in the 1870s and it uh, lost additional uh, territories there and even earlier I should mention the, the, Crimea, the Crimean War um, which also caused it to lose uh, territories. So um, there was a kind of Ottoman political crisis by the late 19th century and uh, what, uh, what rose was a Turkish nationalist movement uh, headed by the Committee, Committee of uh, Union and Progress, which actually was the architect of the genocide. And uh, this party um, had a public face and a, and a secret face. Its public face was that uh, it promoted Western liberal democratic values, it uh, believed in democracy and so on, but uh, its inner circle operated as a, as a kind of secret cabal and uh, they were uh, na very strong nationalists and they believed that Turkey's problems stemmed from the fact that all of these alien people uh, lived in it, that the, that the Armenians and others were a problem. Um, and they moved towards a conception of Turkey as a, uh, as a Turkish nation not a multicultural empire. And uh, what happened was in 1908 they overthrew uh, the, um, the Sultan Abdul Hamid who had ruled since the 1870s and um, uh, they took the reins of power and in initially the main Armenian political party, uh, there were more, there was more than one, but the, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation or the Tashnak Sutyun uh, allied themselves with the CUP uh, because they believed uh, the rhetoric. I think there was a, a, an element of trust there. Um, but as time went on and uh, World War I approached, the most ultra-nationalist factions in the CUP uh, came to power. And in 1913, on the eve of First World War, those elements within the political party engineered an intra-party coup and uh, overthrew and pushed out the more moderate members of the CUP. And uh, when the war started, uh, Turkey um, uh, entered the war by um, uh, bombing or shelling um, 
uh, Russian naval vessels in the Black Sea, and with that action, entered the war on the side of uh, on the side of Germany. And uh, by this time, of course, uh, all of the elements uh, for the genocide were in place. Uh, there was a commitment on the part of the ruling party uh, to uh, simply get rid of this troublesome element in their midst, uh, the Armenians, uh, and also the Greeks, although they were not, uh, they were not uh, victims of genocide to the same degree um, as the Armenians, but they suffered a great deal and they were pushed out of the country uh, by the end of the war and in the early 1920s. Um, and the Assyrians, uh, the same thing, another a smaller Christian group living uh, in Asia Minor. So the genocide was uh, unleashed um, uh, full force uh, in late April of 1915, and uh, by the end of 1916, uh, essentially, uh, the Armenians were uh, no more uh, in Asia Minor. So a population uh, that Armenians estimate as slightly over two million people, although uh, Turkish estimates predictably are smaller than that, uh, probably there were 100 to 150,000 survivors. Not all of these people were killed. Some successfully escaped across the Russian-Turkish border into the South Caucasus. Uh, others, like my, uh, my parents, uh, made, them, made their way to uh, Halep in northern Syria, eventually to Beirut, and then the United States. And there was a significant influx of um, Armenians in, uh, into places like the U.S., Canada, uh, France, Argentina, and Brazil uh, as a result of the genocide. It was a swelling of the Armenian uh, diaspora. Um, so uh, what happened after the war uh, is that uh, the, the, the Ottoman government, the defeated Ottoman government, uh, was, over, uh, was overthrown, uh, this time not by the CUP, because the CUP was in power, but it was overthrown by a Turkish revolutionary movement uh, led by uh, Mustafa Kemal, now known in history books in the West as uh, Ataturk or Kemal Ataturk. And uh, the way that uh, this uh, transition from the Ottoman Empire to the Republic of Turkey, which took place in the fall of 1923, is understood in Turkey, and unfortunately by many Western uh, academic writers uh, who are alleged experts on Turkey, is that this represents a radical break from the past. That, uh, and in fact, um, and this is standard for new countries, but I think it's an ex extreme in the case of Turkey. Um, a whole new history is created. New countries create new histories. Uh, there are new institutions, uh, new origin myths, uh, new understandings of history, and um, completely uh, different reframing of uh, the reality of that period. And that's what's taught uh, to school children and subsequent generations. Um, uh, Turkey, in a way, is an exemplar of this uh, manufacture of a, a new and in uh, major ways falsified history uh, because it had a great deal to conceal. Uh, there was the country's humiliating loss in, one, in World War I, uh, the, really the worldwide global knowledge of uh, what the treatment of Armenians had been, uh, the backwardness of uh, Turkish uh, cultural and uh, social institutions, um, the handicap that these uh, new leaders thought that Islam um, burdened uh, Turkey with. Uh, and so they did make changes. They, uh, they abolished the caliphate. They abolished the sultanate. They uh, declared a secular society. Uh, they promoted uh, literacy. Uh, they created a new alphabet. Um, they destroyed uh, thousands and thousands of books uh, that were written uh, about the history of uh, Asia Minor prior to, um, prior to 1923. They wrote new books. Uh, they even changed the language so that there was a whole generation of uh, Turks coming up who didn't speak the same language as their parents and grandparents and couldn't communicate very well uh, with them. Uh, 
So the official history goes something like this. Uh, the Ottoman, Tur uh, Ottoman Empire ro lost World War I. The country was occupied by uh, invading British, uh, French, Italian, and uh, Russian armies. They concocted a plan to divide Asian Mi Asia Minor into vassal states that they would control. And uh, Ataturk and his people organized a rebellion uh, to foil this. And they, they pushed out the invading armies. They took control of Turkey. They created this new country. They secularized it. And uh, the new Turkey has no ties to the old Turkey. Um, and it's modern, it's forward-looking, it's going to be uh, technologically innovative, and um, it is, uh, uh, at the same time, not going to be controlled by the West. It's not going to be any kind of neo-colonial uh, vassal state. Um, the problem with this um, uh, presentation, which is taught in schools, promoted in the media, um, reflected in public statuary, uh, museum ex exhibits and so on, the whole nine yards, uh, is that uh, it, uh, it erases the very significant contribution of Ottoman minorities, including Armenians, to the history and culture of that part of the world. Um, this goes to such extreme measures that there have been uh, Turkish historians who have claimed that Turks are uh, direct uh, descendants of the Hittites who were long gone by the time uh, the Turks arrived. And in fact, when they did arrive, uh, the majority of the population of Asia Minor was made up of Armenians and Greeks. Um, and gradually they were uh, forced out, uh, in some ways encouraged to leave, uh, and then later uh, outright massacred in huge uh, numbers. So the, this, is the, uh, this is the national myth. To make all of this um, uh, take hold, uh, and I mentioned that with the formation of the Turkish Republic, there was an effort to create new social institutions. Um, the Turkish rulers played, uh, uh, paid a great deal of attention uh, to uh, education, uh, literacy, mm -hmm. and uh, upgrading uh, the intellectual capabilities of their people, all of which is noble and fine if you look at it in that narrow way. But in the Turkish context, it has to be put, uh, it has to be understood more broadly. Um, it's fine to um, uh, create schools and create a mass educational system uh, if the system is not going to be used uh, for the purposes of politically propagandizing your own population. Uh, it's fine to build libraries and cultural centers um, uh, to make books and magazines available to people uh, if the contents of those publications are not heavily censored and uh, are not products of the Turkish Historical Society, which was created by Ataturk in the early 1930s, to uh, disseminate this false history uh, and to obscure the role of, um, of uh, Armenians and other uh, non um, non-Turkish, non-Muslim minorities. Um, and of course, uh, this continues. Um, the, the Kurds, who were uh, recruited by the Ottoman Empire to participate in the genocide, and most often did, although there are some exceptions to this, um, uh, later became the target of um, massacres of uh, Kurds by the Turkish military. Um, and there probably are like a quarter of a million to 300,000 Kurds who were killed uh, as a result of Kurdish rebellions in the 1920s and also the 1930s. And uh, this relationship continues to be uh, very tense uh, today, including uh, in various recent periods armed conflicts uh, between Kurdish uh, rebel forces and the Turkish police and the Turkish military. Um, but the uh, the Kurds were misled into thinking that the problem with the Armenians and the Assyrians and Greeks is that they were Christians, uh, not realizing that actually the underlying ideology and problem was that they were not Turks. Um, and that's, that's an ongoing issue uh, still today. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, that the Armenian uh, 
denial of the Armenian genocide began uh, immediately. I have some examples of that. Uh, in May of um, 1915, a few weeks uh, after the genocide began, um, the, uh, the British, uh, French, and the Russians on a Russian initiative sent um, a letter to the Sublime Port uh, very heavily condemning uh, what was going on regarding the Armenian population. And the Turkish government uh, responded in kind in a, in a lengthy document, and um, the document contains uh, outright denial. Of, I'll list the different types of denial and give you an example of each. Outright denial, quote, it is completely false that there have been massacres of Armenians in the empire. Stonewalling, the imperial Ottoman government opposes these assertions and allegations contained in the preceding declaration with the utmost uh, formal uh, denial. Alleging Armenian collusion with the enemy, quote, the searches of homes of Armenian revolutionaries led to the discovery of revolutionary flags and important documents concerning the insurrection they were fomenting, as well as the separatist aims of the movement. These documents prove, moreover, that the revolutionary committees, which were based actually in Paris, London, and Tiflis, effectively enjoyed the protection of the English, French, and Russian enemy. Alleging Armenian massacres of Muslims and further allegations of Armenian treason. Uh, the Russian government has caused the massacre by Armenians of thousands of peaceful Muslims in the district of Kars, which is in Northeast Asia Minor, and lets them die pitilessly from hunger or thirst or being, or being beaten to death with crosses by the same Armenians who were Ottoman prisoners captured in the Caucasus. And then national security and national sovereignty arguments a quote, in view of these facts, a duty imposed itself on the imperial government, that of suppressing the revolution and maintaining a public order. And this uh, continues now uh, down to the present. Uh, one of the uh, uh, successes of the Turkish deniers is that they have um, uh, created uh, an academic program that trains graduate students at the University of Utah, and the University of Utah Press um, serves as a denialist press that regularly sponsors uh, anti-Armenian denialist uh, conferences and publishes uh, books um, of that genre. Um, going through the period of the 1930s, uh, there are other things that we can mention. Uh, perhaps one of the most uh, notorious and noteworthy uh, is the fate of uh, Franz Werfel's uh, best-selling novel, The Forty Days of Musadach, uh, which was published in German in 1933 and uh, translated into English in uh, 1934. Uh, the book was banned by the Nazis before long, but before that happened, it was a, it was a bestseller uh, in Germany and also was a bestseller here in the United States. Um, the Turkish uh, embassy in Washington got wind of the fact that MGM, uh, Hollywood's largest production company at the time, uh, planned to make a movie. Uh, and uh, I should mention that The Forty Days of Musadah is about uh, one of the successful uh, attempts on the a part of the Armenians to take up arms and to resist um, the, uh, the Turkish attacks that would have led to people uh, being uh, victims of genocide. So uh, people I in this area climbed this mountain on the Mediterranean coast, took all their livestock, bedding, whatever arms and weapons they could uh, muster, um, and uh, defended themselves actually for 56 days, but the the title is The Forty Days, which has some kind of biblical uh, connection that I'm not sure about. You'll have to grant me a pass on that one. Uh, but. Um, the, the survivors, and most people did survive, is that they, they, were, they were rescued by French warships off the coast. And it would have made a, ter a terrific uh, action movie. Uh, one of the leading uh, Hollywood uh, uh, stars of the time, uh, Errol Flynn, uh, was uh, tabbed to be the star of this movie. It was going to have an all-star cast. And uh, the Turkish government started protesting this. Um, 
and uh, even went to the U.S. State Department to get them to intervene, and the State Department did intervene, uh, and the movie project uh, was killed. The movie was never uh, made as a Hollywood movie. Um, there's a very revealing uh, quote here uh, by um, a man uh, named um, Arthur Richard, Arthur Richards, rather, who was a State Department official. Um, he got involved in 1953 uh, because there were periodic attempts to uh, revive this project. Um, it was first uh, uh, proposed and then killed in 1939, and there were several subsequent attempts in the 50s and 60s. And Richards um, uh, said uh, that uh, it was his hope, quote, that the book would never be made into a play or a movie because the Turkish people are particularly sensitive to this period of their history and are trying desperately uh, to cover it up. I think that's a fully accurate statement. Um, and that's what counted for the U.S. State Department, uh, not the truth. Uh, moving this story along a little bit, I think that uh, uh, one of the most uh, destructive um, uh, events in terms of uh, fighting Turkish genocide denial uh, was uh, Turkey's admission into NATO as a result of its participation in the Korean War. Its, re its reward was that it would come into NATO. Uh, this uh, created uh, uh, the possibility of uh, many, many different kinds of alliances between Turkey and the United States, a larger U.S. presence in Turkey, and uh, the ability of Turks to um, uh, pressure the United States to take a denialist position uh, on the Armenian genocide. Uh, let me just say that um, uh, the the whole uh, post World War One uh, position of the Turkish government has been to uh, eradicate not only Armenians physically, but to eradicate in whatever way possible uh, the memory of Armenians. And uh, one form that this took was the destruction of surviving Armenian monasteries and churches uh, within uh, Turkey. Um, these have been um, uh, carved up uh, to salvage building materials. They've been used by the military uh, for uh, target practice and artillery exercises. Uh, and they've been converted to a variety of different uses. Uh, mosques is one of them. Uh, housing, community centers, uh, barns to house livestock, um, jails, um, schools, um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is going on. Uh, it continues to go on. Um, I have a book about it um, called uh, Another Genocide After the Genocide. It was published last year in Armenia. It's written in Armenian, uh, Russian, and, um, and also uh, English. I'd like to um, just uh, point out a few um, of the um, uh, photographs here. Uh, what the authors have done is they have uh, looked at um, uh, photographs uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century of churches and monasteries, and then uh, they have photographs of what these places look like uh, today. So, uh, for example, uh, here is a photograph, top and bottom, of a major Armenian monastery in eastern Turkey. And the top photo is what it looked like in the um, uh, late 1900s, I'm sorry, the late 19th century, and what it looked like when it was photographed by architectural historians in 2010. This is uh, a photograph here of uh, the main Armenian cathedral in Kars, a city in uh, northeastern Asia Minor, not too far from the Armenian Republic. And um, this is what uh, remained of it. There's uh, piles of boulders here uh, after it was uh, demolished by the Turkish uh, government in the 1960s. The only thing that was saved was um, the uh, double door uh, to, the, uh, to the cathedral, um, which is pictured uh, as part of the building over here, and then uh, restored and on display 
at the historical museum in the city of Kars. And um, the interesting thing about this is that the Arme original Armenian version on uh, each panel uh, has two large uh, carved Christian uh, crosses. And uh, in the museum exhibit, uh, these crosses have been uh, removed and the doors have been restained uh, to uh, prevent people from understanding that there was such something there. So you simply have carved vertical lines in the beginning of the, uh, in, in, in the doors and the cross uh, pieces, the, um, the horizontal sections have been uh, removed. Uh, all non-Turks were required to take Turkish names. So um, if, if your original name was Berberian, and the Yan at the end means son of, um, you had to change your name. So you, you, you take off, one way to do this would be to take off the uh, Armenian suffix and uh, attach the um, Turkish equivalent, which is Oğlu. Um, so Berberian becomes Oğlu. And um, this, uh, this was standard operating procedure. Um, the uh, there's also the whole uh, business of uh, uh, geographical formations. Uh, many uh, rivers, uh, streams, mountains, uh, forests, uh, cities and towns had variously, depending on who lived there, uh, Turkish, uh, but in many cases, uh, Greek, Armenian, Arabic, um, Kurdish names. Um, Thousands of these names uh, were changed beginning in the 1950s uh, by uh, a special commission that was set up uh, to Turkify uh, the geography of Turkey. Um, so there are many, many examples of this sort of thing that happened and they continue uh, to go on. This is about Armenian uh, burial stones uh, called uh, cross stones. Um, that were used in Armenian cemeteries. And some of these, I've seen them uh, in Armenia. They can be five, six, seven feet high. Um, this, the, the, these, these would be vertical. But this particular one, uh, and I mentioned one of the uses of, um, of uh, Armenian architectural monuments was to dismantle them and to use the building blocks to create new construction. Uh, uh, schools, community centers, and mosques are typical. Uh, this cross stone has been removed from a cemetery and appears here as part of the foundation of this uh, family's home. Um, so this is part of the desecration of this architectural uh, legacy and it's part of the eradication of an Armenian uh, presence. Another person of the next tier down uh, commented uh, in the 1950s that um, it's not only uh, the Armenian presence that was, unacce that was unacceptable to us, it's the very memory of Armenians and this is what we, this is what we seek to eliminate, this is what we seek uh, to eradicate. So it's a full-scale assault on every aspect of the history of a people. I want to start by saying, focusing from the left, and, and I know Levon and I are, are sort of academics who are, are left wing, and, and there's not a lot of space for that left in the U.S., but in Armenian circles, there, there are even fewer, I would say, right? I mean, you'd, you'd, you know, to really, to really be thinking, linking, you know, and, and what I'm interested in, you know, linking to the Palestinians, linking to other kinds of social justice issues, you know, questioning racial identity and so forth, is not something that happens a lot. Um, and I'm not not denigrating Armenians or anything like that. I don't mean to be negative. It's just not really a big part of the conversation. One uh, set of Armenians has really pushed this um, left issue um, within the Armenian community by starting about 10 years ago something called Armenians and the Left, which morphed into Armenians and progressive politics. Uh, okay, well, we'll, we'll talk. Well, during the question and answer, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that. They're trying to push this. Um, but by the same token, the the and I'm using the left I, again. I'm very hesitant to talk about that because it's a it's sort of an ascriptive term now that people take on themselves that may not have a lot to do with actual practice and actual positions that they're taking. If I can say it that way, um, I'm always and it, it's a bad editorial comment, but I'm always amazed when I see like Slavoj Žižek as a big leftist intellectual. I'm like. 
you know, I, mean, I always think of him sometimes as a Donald Trump of philosophy, but that's another another issue. But you know, we we you know when we talk about about you know sort of left attitudes toward genocide. There is a real disconnect there as well. I think genocide itself, and I'm not talking about the Armenian case, but generally as an issue, okay? Um, and if you go to Rudy Rummel's work, which is complicatedly problematic for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is he was really a cold warrior kind of, you know, from, from the US. But he looks, in his study of genocide from 1900 to 1987, he argues that through genocide and other kinds of related mass killing by governments, somewhere between about 180 and about and more than 300 million civilians, non-combatants, were killed just in those 87 years. Now he purposely doesn't look at the 19th century because he wants to make the case that democracies don't commit genocide and other kinds of governments, including communist governments, do, which is dead wrong as we know. But if you fix the timeline, you know, 1900, you have a lot of indigenous genocide, direct killing genocide in the 19th century and before for hundreds of years. And and so by sort of, and you have the British in Africa, you have all sorts of things happening in the 19th century, but as colonialism transforms, you have fewer of those kind of blatant, destructive genocides, mostly because people aren't left to kill anymore, the, the process has been completed, than you do in the 20th century. In the 20th century, you do have, you know, for instance, um, you know, mainland China killing tens of millions of people. You have Stalin killing, you know, upwards of 30 million people and so forth. And so, the, you know, it's easy for him to make his argument. Um, but there's been a real problem, I think, in engaging genocide um, from the left. And I was just thinking today, actually, I wanted to add this in. I was just thinking, um, you know, probably the most well-known work from the left on genocide is um, uh, Herman and Peterson's The Politics of Genocide, which was an, essentially a denialist work um, defending the perpetrators of the Rwandan genocide. Um, and it's really problematic. And of course, it kills me to say this, but Noam Chomsky wrote the foreword for this. As he did, some of you will know, for um, Farasan, uh, uh, work in the, I want to say 1986, but I might have that wrong. Farasan, who's a major French denier of the Holocaust, Chomsky wrote uh, a, a sort of promotional foreword for him. Um, this is three decades ago based on a sort of naive, I guess, free speech, everyone should talk about every issue and, and so forth. And, um, and Chomsky was also really a problem when the Cambodian genocide was happening because he didn't want to admit that communists can commit genocide, right? Because you want to, if you're coming out of the Vietnam War, right, clearly the U.S. was supporting what I would consider genocidal. I think, you know, if you look at the free fire zones and so forth, they fit the UN definition. There's a lot of other stuff that did. And, you know, against a communist movement, but quickly after that, you have another genocide committed by a communist regime, right? So there's this whole leftist thing of resistance to seeing that. Um, even though Chomsky at the same time was great on East Timor, say, which is being which was, which was, you know, by a, uh, you know, being carried out by a, a, I won't say a client state of the U.S., Britain, and, and Australia, but certainly Indonesia at that time was heavily aided by us militarily, politically, and so forth. He, he would have been much better yeah. off saying yes, the communist Cambodians did it, but the Vietnamese communists stopped it. Yeah, the, I mean, exactly. The, actually, Vietnam was one of the few groups that's ever stopped the genocide, which, which is significant. You're right. Um, but anyway, so, so there's been a really problematic relationship, and I think part of that comes from the way we understand genocide, um, the focus on the Holocaust, and, and, and I think there should be some focus on the Holocaust because it is a huge, or was a huge event that involves so much of, of European and in history and even beyond, and so many political forces that are still very active um, in, in the contemporary world. But we want to, I think the people who talk about genocide, genocide scholars a lot of times, and I'm not talking about the Armenian case in particular, tend to talk about genocide as an aberration in an otherwise acceptable status quo, right? Hitler comes to power and he messes up, you know, sort of modern Europe or contemporary Europe. And you get rid of the fascists, and then we can go back to a nice political order. The reality, if you start studying genocide, is far different. Rather than genocide being aberration, it's the norm, 
right? The Armenian Genocide was not the first genocide of the 20th century. In some sense, there was no first genocide of the 20th century because there were genocides happening, well, there were genocides happening in the 19th century that just continued on against indigenous groups in various places, um, a, a, you know, a whole range of things. But the Herrero, starting in 1904, right, are the sort of first new genocide that, that happens. And from there, the 20th 20th century, I mean, just didn't stop, right? I mean, you, there are dozens and dozens. I was going to list them out, but I don't think we have time. Just the big ones that everyone, you know, documents well. But there are just so many cases of genocide. It is a constant kind of refrain. And this goes back, I would argue, more than 500 years. I mean, certainly the, uh, you know, Columbus coming to the Americas um, and, you know, killing some estimates as many as two million people directly and indirectly in, in his sort of lifetime, right? Alienating uh, Delacassus, who had been, you know, was a friend of the Columbus family back in, you know, in, in Italy, connected in all these kinds of ways, but uh, not Italy, I want to say Spain, connected to the Columbus family, and who is so horrified by what um, what the invading Europeans do that he becomes an advocate for indigenous, you know, protection of indigenous people. Seeing that, you know, that history sort of starting things off, um, and Ward Churchill was sort of complicated on, on some of these issues in, in terms of um, maybe not getting into some of the, the details that he might to, to nuance his account of Native American genocide, at the same time I think is tremendous in, in providing a framework and so forth, and really argues that you can look at four, 1492 to the present, or he's arguing this in the, in the 90s actually, but I think you can extend it to the present, as one sort of long-term genocidal project. And this is what I think um, from the left we tend to, to miss, that genocide is one very important force that has functioned for the past 500 years. It's actually functioned for, you know, since ancient times, but in the development of what we might call the sort of Western liberal slash, I guess, bad communist, whatever you want to say, um, industrial, liberal individualist, whatever order that structures the world that we have. Genocide is one of the forces. Slavery, apartheid, mass violence, um, and individual violence, which is really mass violence in, in a different form against women and girls, um, uh, uh, aggressive militarism and conquest militarism, um, colonialism, imperialism, and, and other related forces, I'll call them, I mean, and, and activities by, by various groups have shaped the world that we live in. Absolutely shaped it. We can't, you know, we talk about demographics and, and things like that. You look at where people live in the world, who lives where, who has power where, and these are the forces that account for that. And it's not, it's, you can look at our, you're talking about Nakhichevan and, and things like that, where populations are and they aren't, who controls, who decides, all these kinds of things. Really the entire globe, it's hard to find a place where that's untouched by these processes in different ways. And that often means the total destruction of indigenous peoples and, and other peoples and their replacement, which is one of the key features that Raphael Lemkin, who coined the term genocide, included in the concept of genocide. This, this complete overlay of the perpetrator group over whatever existed before they were in a territory, sort of classic colonialist genocide and, and settler colonialist expansionism. So anyway, as we, as we come to that, I want to suggest that, that um, reparations is one very important component in addressing the world that we, that we have. To try to understand um, where um, reparations fits into what I would say is, is, I hate the word social justice now, or the term social justice, because it's also sort of been gutted of its meaning, but really serious even revolutionary politics has been gutted of its meaning, but, but you know what I'm saying. Like a real transformative politics. Reparations, I think, is a really important part of that because so many groups for so long are dealing with the aftermath of what they experience. Um, we talk about Armenia, um, and I'm going to use that as a quick example and then suggest a few other examples. Um, but the Armenian case, um, it's important to understand that genocide is not just about killing people, as if that's not enough. It's really about a total destruction. And it can destroy part of a group and leave some, or it can kill part of a group and leave some people alive, as all genocide, or most genocides do, I won't say all of them. But that doesn't mean those people are free from the effects of genocide, okay? So there's a dramatic demographic destruction that happens. 
Okay, and, and again, if you look at Native Americans in the U.S., going from many millions just in the continental U.S. by many estimates, down to by about 1900 was about 250,000. That changes completely, not just what Native Americans were 115 years ago, 116 years ago, but it completely determines what political power they have, what ability to protect themselves they have, what strength their identity has in the contemporary world, all these kinds of issues. The economic situations that they're in, it's very similar for Armenians. Whether you're the residual community in Turkey that's heavily discriminated against, maybe 50,000 or so, deeply discriminated against, including you know through murder. Um, uh, assassinations of, of, for instance, Ferran Dink was a political, politically active Armenian journalist, Armenian Turkish journalist, um, who was killed. But elderly women in Istanbul who are now, over the past few years, have been attacked frequently and beaten at, because they're Armenian. It's sort of as these sort of hate crimes that have been coming up, these 80-year-old women just going home or whatever. So there's this, this kind of stuff that's happening. And outside of our, uh, you know, for Armenians, this legacy of 100 years, and again, very similar for, for most other groups that have experienced genocide, slavery, apartheid, all these kinds of things, that these groups, um, I, I'm sorry, that Armenians deal with this demographic collapse. You mentioned intergenerational trauma. I mean, the effect of massive sexual violence, I mean, nearly universal sexual violence, um, well, you know, was devastating. It, it affected birth rates, it affected mental health. I mean, it still affects mental health, I think, because of the intergenerational transfer of, of the trauma that occurred. Um, the enslavement of Armenians for various work projects that, you know, not only took their labor and used it for the very people who were destroying their their group, but you know, kept it from from being used for other other things. This is during the genocide. Um, the impact of of the destruction of identity, not just the demographic shrinking of an identity, but this assault on identity. You mentioned many ways. You know, the cultural heritage, the educational institutions, the religious institutions, which have a, a, a an inter very interesting and vibrant role within Armenian uh, life that goes beyond sort of traditional religious uh, roles. Um, uh, you know, artistic and literary, musical destruction, I mean, all these, this, these heritages that were destroyed, that were cut off. Um, and in all these ways that uh, the identity of, of victim groups like the Armenians become so frail that they're always in question. Armenians are spread around the world, um, and many Armenians don't have any kind of easy connection. If you're Turkish and you grow up in Turkey, you're Turkish. You could hate Turkey. You can not want to speak Turkish, whatever it is. You are Turkish, and Turkish identity is in no danger. But for Armenians, you have to choose, especially if you're in the diaspora, especially in a place like the U.S., you have to choose to be Armenian, and it takes a lot of work, a lot of resources at the individual level and community level. This is another legacy of genocide that, that impacts, impacts Armenians. And to take this, I mean, we could spend a lot of time, I'm going to try to wrap this up. To go beyond this a little bit, you can look at the massive wealth expropriation. I think there's a whole sort of area to explore from a critique of capitalism and, and, and economic policies and, and sort of modernization um, to look at this. But everything that Armenians, Assyrians, and, and Greeks that fled had pretty much was taken. I mean, yeah, wealthy, I mean, people that had factories and warehouses and, and businesses and so forth. Yes, but right down to, you know, the little bit of money that, that many peasant Armenians, the majority of Armenians were essentially peasants, that they had. Their beds, their, um, uh, you know, houses, their land, their, their sheep, whatever it was, everything was taken. Right down to, on the deportation marches, the clothing that was on their back, so you have frequent Eyewitness accounts of Armenians walking naked through a desert, which, you know, is astounding. The shoes, the kitchen pots and pans, everything was taken. And as Temel Demerer, who's a who's a uh, leftist um, activist in Turkey, and this has been corroborated by a number of scholars doing research to sort of deal with this, has talked about the Turkish economy of this new republic that that Levon talked about in 1923 was built through the expropriated wealth from the Armenians. Assyrians and Greeks that were taken, and that was a big part of the agenda for the genocide. So when I talk about reparations, this, is, this has had a huge impact on Armenians going forward. Um, Armenians living in Syria, for instance, were forced to live in Syria as refugees of, of the genocide and to live in a, in a complicated political 
landscape for the last hundred years that has exploded in a lot of anti-Christian violence and, and expulsion and so forth, right? That's a legacy of the genocide. You didn't have a secure place to live. Beirut, the Armenians that went through what happened in Beirut. There's a lot of this insecurity. Azerbaijan and, and, and uh, the, the repression of Karabakh is a great example of this, right? As a legacy of genocide, as a fact that Armenia, through demographic destruction through the fact that Ataturk was allowed to take the bulk of Armenia by those who were supposedly going to protect Armenians, France, the U.S. and so forth from 19, or in about 1920, conquered it, brought it back into, into Turkey. There was an Armenia 1918 to 1920 that was supposed to be a, a haven for Armenian survivors and others who were trying to rebuild their nation. That was taken and split between the new Soviet Union and, and um, Turkey. And so that's another part of the legacy, a destruction of identity, a destruction of geopolitical power. Even had the genocide happened, but the Armenian Republic been allowed to exist by Ataturk and the new Turkish uh, Republic, there are you know, typical estimates um, based on you know, t you know, the usual ways we do demography say that there would be a, an Armenian Republic of about 20, 000, uh, 20 million people today, which is Syria, Iraq, and so forth. It would be a completely different geopolitical picture. You know, the Karabakh situation, Artsakh, it would be completely different, right? There would be no way to victimize Armenians who are minorities in the area of, of the Middle East and Western Asia if there were this powerful, oh, I shouldn't say powerful, I wouldn't want it to be powerful in the wrong way, but sizable, secure Armenian state. And again, there are all the problems that go with statehood with that, and we can, we can talk about that. So Armenians, and, and, I'll, and I'll try to do this again, I've been saying I'm going to be brief, I'll try to do this very briefly. Armenians are in a very precarious situation now globally within the Armenian Republic, which may well disappear. It's a tiny and maybe officially 3 million, but it's probably about 1.8 million right now, Armenians, um, in the Armenian Republic, largely because of pressure from outside, the Karabakh War, uh, blockade by Turkey, neo-imperialism neo by, by Russia, and, and so forth. And it may not exist in 50 years. Diasporan communities might not exist in 50 years. They're fading pretty quickly. Um, groups, Armenian groups in Lebanon, in Syria, and other places that are hotspots right now are disappearing. Um, there, there are relatively few Armenians, or maybe 60 to 100,000 Armenians in Syria before ISIS and, and everything happened. There are, m uh, the majority of them are now gone, and their long-term homeland, you know, destroyed. Um, so for Armenians, reparations represents something that is not some abstract ideal, desire, justice thing. It's about survival. It's about long-term viability. And without getting into other, other cases, it's really something that genocide survivor groups need. Um, I want to end by saying the, the, the part that I, that I would like, uh, you know, I'll be maybe trying to publish at some point, is that, that it's very important to look at the call for this one group's reparations as part of a much bigger reparations movement, a global reparations movement, which my opinion has been emerging for the last 10 to 15 years um, globally. A lot of groups are linking up um, and starting to talk about, and this brings me back to what I was saying about this 500 years of destruction. People are starting to look not for individual reparations, and I'm completely against that in terms of the Armenian case and others. It really has to be community reparations aimed at protecting and rebuilding uh, you know, a group identity in a positive way, not just individual cash payments so suddenly you can trade your Camry for a Lexus or whatever it is that you want to do. You know, that's not the point of reparations. And we're really starting to see this group or this, this global movement for reparations whose bigger goal, I think, is trying to challenge the way in which the world has been structured by these forces of genocide and slavery and apartheid and so forth that I mentioned. And that's really where I want to see the Armenian case go, connected into this bigger process of really transforming the world because although it would be helpful to Armenians to get reparations and have a decent situation compared to what exists now for Armenians in places like Artsakh, the Republic, and Turkey and so forth, um, if that's the end game for Armenians, that might be gained, but there'll be dozens of other groups with similar histories that are going to be left for their slow destruction. Um, and we need to really start looking at you know, re reparations as a tool of revolution, not something that's really inscribing victim groups back into a capitalist world order by just compensating them financially and, and thinking that now you've made them 
able to survive within a capitalist world, what we need to do is really transform the world that we're in away from these kinds of forces. And thank you for, for listening.